Welcome back to the Bentonville Beacon Podcast, where we're sharing stories and advice from the leaders sparking the rise of Bentonville, one of the fastest growing and most dynamic cities in the United States, nestled in the Ozark Mountains of Northwest Arkansas in the heartland of America. Hey, I'm your host, James Bell, and I am absolutely thrilled today to have Sam Dean in the studio. In fact, the inner child in me has been ready for this interview for quite a while. Uh, Sam is the founding executive director of the Scott Family Amazium, which is a place here in Bentonville where families have the opportunity to laugh, imagine, play, question, and explore together. And where experiences lead to curiosity and more exploration, exploration, that word I can't say, at home and in school. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks, James. Been <clears throat> long time listener, first time guest. Awesome. Well, let's get started uh, by getting to know you. Who is Sam Dean? What should the audience know about you? Gosh, that sounds like the uh, beginning of a, a trailer of a movie or, right? <laughs> or some type of serial on uh, Netflix or something. You have the right name for it. <laughs> Who Sam is Dean. Sam Dean. Um, look, I'm, I'm a science nerd. I love science. I love science in all its forms. Um, always, uh, my my father's a scientist. was a was a geologist, um, uh, uh, a researcher at University of Toledo. Uh, I myself have a background in biology and geology. Uh, I'm a med school dropout. Come, maybe we'll come back to that in a little bit. I'm a pre med dropout. Good for you making it to med right? school. You well, you know, I, I made it far enough to know it's not what I wanted to do, and I think that's part of the story of how we end up where we go. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, for, for a long time, I was called Sam Dean, the science machine doing media spots, you know, on, on television and, and, uh, radio. In fact, I wanted to be Bill Nye, the science guy. That was, that was one of my pathways. So I love science. I love learning about the world around us. It's the world's an interesting place and, and, uh, enjoy being able to, to, uh, have a job where I get to explore it and to get a chance to share that passion and curiosity with kids and families, uh, now around uh, Northwest Arkansas. So cool. Uh, well, before we start talking about the Scott Family Amazium, uh, I'm super curious to know how you got here. Uh, you know, Sam, I look at your background. I see your roles at, I'll see my notes say, the Center of Science and Industry in Toledo, the Fort Worth Museum of Science and Technology, and the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Uh, will you talk about those experiences? And in particular, I'm curious um, about how those roles and places helped you explore your passions to uh, help shape and prepare you to imagine and found and lead the Scott Family Amazium. It's all happenstance. I mean, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I was just talking to someone about this the other day about how we get to where we get. And, um, you know, what's interesting is I, I love science, always have loved science. Um, if you love science and you're good at school, the first thing you know you get told that you should do is go be a scientist. Mm -hmm. well, I, I did that. I did research for a bit. Um, that's not on my my bio. I did research in groundwater and did research with my dad and and doing geologic mapping in in West Virginia, and and I found out that that wasn't that wasn't what I loved to do day in and day out. I loved reading about. I loved learning about uh, the research that was happening, but didn't love that as a pathway for myself. I'd always worked with kids and families as a as a science and nature counselor at YMCA camps and mm -hmm. and uh, other camps uh, around the the, the Northwest uh, Ohio area, and so you know for me I think part of the story is how do we end up where we are? Well, often our training isn't our formal training isn't what gets us to where we want to go. It's these other experiences that happen on the way to A to Z. And you were just telling me like your background is is so different than what you're doing now, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you were uh, what was your training? Uh, my first training was essentially a glorified econ uh, economics. Well, let's try that again. Electronics degree. I was repairing medical equipment. Right, right. So uh, in, in fact, we did the statewide maker summit um, a number of years ago, and we asked 200 people in the room, how many of you are doing the job that you went to school for? <laughs> no one raised their hand. Wow. So so that being said, uh, I, uh, a trained biologist, et cetera. Um, and, but on the way to go to, on the way to go to medical school, I started working in a, in a museum that had just formed in my hometown of Toledo, Ohio, uh, the center of science industry, Toledo, uh, Cosi Toledo. And what it, what I found is I found, a, I found my home, 
found a place where science communication was happening, found a place where we could get kids and families who are coming to the place hungry to learn about science. And we were able to, to have these, mo these really special moments that happen, right? Um, with kids and their families and our team. Um, so what I found is that by starting to work in the museum world, I found a place that I fell in love with been doing that now for about 26 years. Nice. And so what I found is here, there was a job that I found I could become a career or could become a, 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 a an ongoing job because I started part-time and then it could become a career. And so I've, I, I like to make that my career and I've been fortunate to follow to museums. Uh, so Fort Worth uh, Museum of Science and History uh, was pound for pound, one of the most, I think, interesting museums um, that's that we're just connecting in all these projects about natural history, uh, about uh, hands-on science, about uh, uh, tinkering and making. So uh, I was fortunate to head to Fort Worth uh, to work with some really great leaders in the field and then went to the Exploratorium, which was one of the first hands-on science museums in North America, uh, founded in 1969 by Frank Oppenheimer. And um, <clears throat> what the Exploratorium prepared me to do is really think about not just the museum work, but the depth that we could go, but also how to think about maybe scaling it uh, uh, and thinking about it more holistically as a business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, love of science, love of education, and um, trying to think about it like a business really prepared me for what a next step was, which was uh, the Scott Family Museum. That is cool. Well, how, how then does a guy from Ohio end up at all these amazing places and then land here in Bentonville to create the Amazium? There's so many ways to answer that. I mean, one is just uh, fortunate. <clears throat> you know, when, when you kind of commit and work in a field like uh, in museums, you know, the, the field is really all about supporting folks who are who are um, who are uh, in it. So fortunate to have lots of mentors who have sort of helped coach me along the way and who be from who are friends, and colleagues and partners all across the country. Um, what but more specifically, my role at the Exploratorium was to take a look at the breadth of the museum. The museum at that time was going through about a three hundred million dollar capital campaign. It was moving from its place in in um, at the Palace of Fine Arts in the Marina District down to uh, two piers uh, along the Embarcadero. That being said, the museum itself, about $50, $60 million a year organization, um, I think at that time, 450, 500 team members. Um, and my work was to actually help plumb some of the great um, intellectual projects that were happening in the museum mm -hmm. and figure out ways to make that work available to the rest of the museum world. Um, so in some ways, I was now doing sales and partnerships and and so so uh, i was doing some business development for the museum you know the thing i knew nothing about um but of i knew, knew right that sometimes you end up in business development and, and then you have to figure it out along the way and so we were we were working with we were already selling museum uh, exhibits to museums all around the around the world in fact any given year might be 200 300 exhibits we were selling to 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 other places but what we wanted to do is kind of continue to dive deeper into the intellectual property of the of the museum because the field was so hungry for a lot of the things that we were doing. So we did master planning in, in places uh, uh, like Abu Dhabi and, and Turkey. Mm. Um, we're doing work in uh, Europe, of course, and some places in, in South America. But one of the projects that came up, um, we were actually in, in Amarillo, Texas. We were helping host a, 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 an exhibition on tinkering that we had created and we were debuting there. We helped host a festival called uh, Mindfest there um, that um, the uh, Don Harrington Discovery Center was doing. And there was this network of museums in um, Arkansas, uh, the Arkansas Discovery Network. And um, the, the head of the network uh, at that time, Diane LaFollette, who, who now runs the Mid-America Science Museum down in Hot Springs, came out. And we just, we had a moment and, mm -hmm. and we had this conversation that could we take this work that was happening kind of around the country and make it available for Arkansas. So we put together a three, three, three factor um, uh, project. One, we built seven tinkering studios in conjunction with seven museums all across the state. Um, we put together a festival of making and tinkering that we call Tinkerfest. Uh, that is now being done by, by the way, museums all over the country, um, including cool. including our own. And then we put together two and a half years of professional development for museum uh, museums across the state. 
And those three things together led to this wonderful opportunity to have this guy who now is living in the Bay Area, spending a lot of time in Arkansas. And, and it was actually you know, Diane who said, you should go check out. There's something really interesting happening up in Northwest Arkansas. So I had a moment to be able to connect and um, came up here and uh, fell in love with, with a project that a board of directors had started and, and volunteers had been running for, gosh, seven years, six wow. or seven years. And um, the moment just they came together. The moment was right. Um, I wasn't looking to leave where I was, but you could just f- you could feel the energy here, right? I mean, I don't I don't know about your feeling about moving here, but mm-hmm. you just knew that there was this wonderful moment, and so the board trusted me to come on board to help build the team and then build the organization out from from where it was to where we are now. Well, wow. I keep hearing so many stories of folks, sort of, you know, coming to visit checking out what's happening here and they knew it was a moment and they had to be here. And my story's not any different than that. Uh, either we had to be here once we discovered Bentonville and what it was all about. I mean, we were already looking at Northwest Arkansas. We thought we were going to Fayetteville. Uh, and then we <laughs> discovered Bentonville and went, this is it. And this is the thing I must do right now. And, and it's cool to hear, uh, your story in that way, uh, as well. Although your story is kind of cooler, a lot cooler. Uh, <laughs> we'll call it even. Okay, sounds good. Uh, well, let's talk about the Scott Family Amazium. Um, what's the high-level story? Get into your mission. Talk about, I guess, exhibits, programming, whatever it is you'd like to share to help our audience understand what they're missing out on and what they'll see when they visit. I'll say uh, there's a game sometimes you play when you do introductions, sort of two truths and a lie. Um, and, and I'll start with the lie first, that the Scott Family Amazium is a, a museum. Because um, we are, but that's not our full story. But let me start with that. So uh, the Scott Family Museum is a hands-on museum. We're about sparking and nurturing the curious and creative spirit in all of us. Um, it's uh, this wonderful, uh, about 55,000 square feet, um, and then an acre of outdoor playscape. Mm-hmm. And it, it's about, uh, it's a place that's about having questions and the opportunity and time to be able to explore those questions, whether it's hands-on, hearts-on, minds on. It's a spot that's great for, for young kids, but, but we think it's a great place for um, folks of all ages. If you're curious, willing to make a mess and dive into to painting on glass or climbing through a multi-story climber or taking apart toys in, in our tinkering hub um, or, or replaying the role of a market. We've got a small market experience here. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, uh, that would make a lot of sense in our, our neck of the woods. Um, so it's a space that's about experiential learning. <clears throat> so in, in some ways, we think it's a learning laboratory, um, except we use exhibits as one of our tools. And then we have this great team that we've trained, play facilitators and program educators who add in additional layers of depth to what's happening in the museum uh, itself, whether they bring out zinglet bags, mm-hmm. bags of props, or they do we do pop-ups all over because we know that moment of change um, is part of the important part of the experience. Every time you come in, there might be something new. And then layering in special events and festivals. So they're, it's kind of like a, 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 sam- a cartoon sandwich, right, that gets ridiculously thick as you add in all uh-huh. these layers. Um, and so I, I say that's a lie because because that's only part of the story. It's really the tip of the iceberg. Two thirds of actually what the amazium is is below the waterline. Mm-hmm. We do camps and workshops with kids and families. We do um, teacher professional development for eight to nine hundred teachers a year. We're working with school districts to rethink build uh, the design of their buildings. Um, we're doing exhibit exhibition design work in public art. Uh, we have a fully functional uh, exhibition shop that's a creative shop. We're having makers and residents come through to build pieces that you see not just at the Amazium, but uh, increasingly at other places around the region and, and we think nationally in the next handful of years. So there's so much going on where the museum is a key part of it. But boy, there's a whole lot going on along the waterline in terms of advancing kind of creativity and learning and education. That is that is so much fun, and you know I, I bring my boy there uh, quite often. We haven't really gotten below the water line yet. Oh, we've gotten to the water. I, I walked in with the kid fifteen minutes before close one day, and my wife said because we have a membership, and my wife said uh, I'll just hang out up front. And fifteen minutes later, we came back out, and he was soaked from head to toe. And the only way that I knew I was going to be okay with that is to just go all in. So I dropped him on my shoulder and we walked out proudly with him so tremendous. It was great. So we love playing in the water experience. He's he's finally starting to 
climb up, uh, all the climbing experience. He loves the big truck oh, and yeah. he absolutely loves the market. He goes to the market every single time. He's the kid who fills the basket and just leaves the stuff everywhere that somebody's having to clean up. But, uh, we have a blast. We, I've had to straighten up after uh, your kid, I think, or it, or probably, or when uh, I believe for uh, New Year's Eve, I, I see you, I saw you <laughs> recreating a, uh, a, a zing in the New Year moment yes. with it, with uh, uh, with your with your partner and your kiddo, um, uh, leaving some confetti mess, which was perfectly yeah. okay. We were happy to sweep up after that. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> it, it turned into an amazing photo. Uh, <laughs> and, well, the one that you took of me taking the photo was amazing as well. <laughs> How does a thought or an idea become an exhibit? Will you talk about that process, who's behind it, and what it really takes to transform that thought into uh, an exhibit or an experience, if you will? Sure. I mean, there, 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 there are lots of pathways that can happen. Um, and it's only outline in the big, so the thing about sort of like the beginning part of the funnel, uh, when you start to work up the big idea, we would call mm -hmm. it, whether it's an ex exhibition, like a full s collection of exhibits or an individual exhibit often starts with some kind of push or nudge. Maybe it's a partner we're working with. Maybe it's a phenomenon we saw that we thought was really interesting, or maybe it's a, a, a an idea that we want to explore. In fact, we're starting to explore a collection of exhibits about kind of airflow and aerodynamics, Maybe. but really think about it from like a natural phenomenon wind perspective. So we'll be, I mean, spoiler alert, this is what we'll be exploring for creating some experiences for this fall. Uh, but but the thing is that like ideas, and what I, what I love is the problem. As I as I as I listen to uh, previous podcasts you've had on on the on the beacon, here it's um this idea that ideas are actually pretty cheap. Ideas mm -hmm. are easy. You know, you can walk into a room and people are willing to throw a ton of ideas on the wall. But you need to do that, right? Because uh, what is the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. That's right. But you got to do something with it then, and so I think the ma one of the magical things about the uh, the amazium and museums that have active shops, they don't have an idea and send it off to someone else to then figure out how to make it happen. We have an active shop, so you take a concept. Let's say we want to make we want to make a room that you know lets you um, that has an airflow that goes around that kind of makes you feel like you're in the middle of like a, a windy day in a meadow. Hmm. You know, then we'll start working on concepts on that. So we might draw it. We might look for benchmarks of other places that have had experiences like that. Well, so we'll start to draw up some of our concept maps, mood boards, might have sketches. We might develop little models, right? We'll start to go into our concept. And then if there's there there, we might move into prototyping it. Cool. Do a little sketch design. So for us, you know, if if an idea is gonna see the light of day at the end of the, the end of the funnel, it can't just have been drawn and then built and put on the floor, it's gonna go through a series of design processes. So we'll maybe we'll, we'll build a mock-up prototype. We'll pull out fans from you know the shop or we'll go buy some fans and, and then we'll create, you know maybe out of cardboard, we'll create a structure and then we'll let our team play with it. We might take it out on the museum floor, let uh, visitors and guests play with it. Let's see if there's some there there. Can't, is there, is there enough oomph behind it? Is, it? is it doing what we want it to do? Is there something more interesting? And because often you find during these early testing phases that there's actually something more interesting about it. And because mm. kids are the inveterate um, folks who uh, who use things differently than how we plan, often kids will guide us down a more interesting pathway than we have for ourselves. So we'll go through a round of kind of iterative design work. So so just like you're doing product engineering or something else, you're gonna do a prototype. You may do another prototype. At any point, you might you might stop a project because either it is too expensive, it's not that interesting, it could be dangerous. So we'll go through all these series of things. Meanwhile, we'll move along. You know, what, what kind of label? Like, what do we want people to know? Does it need to have a label? Maybe ideally it doesn't have a label next to it. Um, so we'll move through, you know, graphic design. At the same time, we're starting to move along kind of this, this exhibition and product design. We'll do sketch design, design development. And then, you know, at that point, we might just go right into a, a build phase. You know, at a point we'll rethink that there's a pathway between from where we are and what a final piece might look like, then we'll go into a straight up fabrication mode where we'll, we'll, we'll draw it up, we'll build it, you know, for us documenting along the way, because if, if we think it's interesting, we want to be able to replicate it. And sure enough, we want to know how to fix it if something goes wrong. So, you know, we learned a lot of the documentation a lot of engineers have to do for their processes. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, 
we'll, we'll give it, we'll give it a, we'll give it light a day and see how it goes. And often there's this period of then paying attention to it to do kind of summative evaluation and see, is it accomplishing what we want? If so, great. Often there's some things, tweaks you need to do. So often even after something debuts, you know, you'll, you'll be doing your, um, you'll be doing a punch list. You'll be doing, you know, modifications all along the way and then recording what you do differently next time. Cause hopefully there's another museum who wants that. That's right. Maybe we'll build it for them. That's, that's pretty neat. I love it. Um, surely there must be, I guess you're doing airflow. There's, there's all kinds of things in Bentonville related to that. Like our aircraft manufacturer. That's right. Um, it's making me think about all kinds of possibilities. Maybe for an you. expansion of an airport nearby. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. There's a I've, lot going on. I've heard of those things. <laughs> uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to ask you briefly about this sure. next question. That's directly related. You have a new exhibit coming up. What is that? So, so we're in the midst of this. It's called uh, In the Making. We're about halfway through its, its tenure. And, and really what we want to do is explore this messy middle part. Often stories have beginnings and endings, mm -hmm. right? This is how we, we have, uh, uh, this is how we often tell stories. And what we want to celebrate is this middle part of iterative design. The moment you try something and it worked or it didn't work. And yeah. how do you iterate through an idea? And what we want to do is tell that story because we think here are the moments where you hit a roadblock. And uh, you've got to learn how to persevere through it. And we think, and particularly in working with kids, that that's that moment will be whether you're successful or not. It's not necessarily your beginning or your end. It's how you push through these middle hurdles. And we want to make bare the things that we're learning along the way and invite people to be part of that process in a more explicit way, not just sort of behind our shop doors. Neat. Um, that's really neat. You talked about earlier about uh, some of the museums, programs, education, and so on. How how is the museum connecting with the the broader community in, in Northwest Arkansas schools, organizations, and so on? We uh, one of the you know I think part of the secret sauce of, of Benville is is that uh, everyone's looking to work together. Mm -hmm. So from day one, the school districts were in fact our first Tinkerfest. We didn't have a we didn't have a um, a location for it because we hadn't have we didn't have a museum yet. Oh, wow. We didn't have property yet, and it was the principal of one of the uh, local schools who said, "Look, come to my school, host this festival of making and tinkering at our space." And we go, well, you don't get it. Like, it's going to be messy. We're going to be taking apart a car. Wow. We're going to. And he's like, you'll have it at our place. So Old High Middle School was the location of our first uh, Tinkerfest. And we made a mess. And they loved it. Everyone loved it. So anyway, a business has been, uh, what we love is being able to work with businesses. We do community spotlights. We do a lot of work uh, introducing kids to professionals um, in field, uh, particularly for moments like we have girls in steam uh, 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 camps, et cetera. So the business community has been so wonderful. I do, some day, times I wish we had more hours in a day or more days in a year to be able to do more of the programming and highlighting uh, this growing kind of steam community here. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, well, you just had a recent anniversary, 10 years, right? 10 years at the Amazium? A decade, yeah. Ooh. Wow, that's that's pretty impressive. Uh, <laughs> you know, we talked about the top of the episode that, uh, you know, you've lived and worked and played in these places like Toledo and Dallas-Fort Worth area, San Francisco. What is it about Bentonville that stands out um, versus those? I mean, I think, I, I think the... Uh, I'll say again, the special sauce is that <clears throat> there are so many amazing folks in this community. So I'll say two things. One, this community wants to work together. I f you can feel it here that that people feel like we are collectively trying to advance this whole region. And, and that's not just you know, in press releases and other moments. It's the moments when you really need to actually make movement on something that People will look to support you. People are so supportive in this area about, and people are accessible. They pick up the phone. They answer the phone. They're willing to meet over coffee. They're willing to work late. I mean, the, the, the sheer amount of volunteer hours in the nonprofit community alone from this incredible community is, is um, staggering. And you can feel this energy that people have their jobs um, if, if the, here, but then they're also willing to advance the community in any way that, that they can. And, um, that's pretty rare. I mean, I, I think this, this moment in time is, is just, um, it's bottled lightning. It, it is. Look, I've been around a lot of places and I hear aspects of what you talked about where people talk about, oh, this place has this, or this place has that. Um, and I've never felt it 
and I think you said it right, feel the energy. I've never felt it the way I feel it here. I've had people tell me that I came here and I stood at the square without talking to anybody. I felt the energy. Yeah. And then they get into the community and discover what's going on. But people are accessible and supportive in a way that you just will not find anywhere else. And I challenge anybody to 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 uh, to um, find that that's not true or to show me somewhere else that has that kind of energy about it. I, I, I haven't found it anywhere else. And I've lived all over the country and worked all over the world. So. And I think you also find, particularly at this moment where the size of the community is still small enough that the aspirations are limitless, but the size is that you, you bump into people differently here mm -hmm. than I did in San Francisco, this incredibly creative city. And yet there were lanes, there were neighborhoods. I mean, it was a very different moment of collisions than happened here where people who are just running, like I... Like I'm, I'm spending time talking to folks in retail technology, not an area I probably would have explored if I was in any other city, but here having this wonderful journey of learning about like this, these other pathways. And I feel everyone is b bumping into folks who are in very different lanes, yeah. but having these really cool um, crossover conversations. A absolutely. Well, you live your days in a sense in kids' heads and people's <laughs> heads trying to figure out what helps them imagine and play and have fun. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thinking through a kid's head uh, or a kid's perspective, what would you say is the perfect weekend in Bentonville and Northwest Arkansas? Okay. Are you, are you ready? We're going to go fast through this. Thursday night, I'm either down at, because it's a, it's going to be an extended weekend. Yes. So Thursday night, I will be down maybe at Springdale for uh, a, a, a turnbow at the park or, or down a first Thursday uh, down at, around the Fayetteville Square, yeah. right? So I have a great moment. I've got school the next day, though, so I go to school. But boy, my parents, and, and I have a great day at, at, let's say I'm going to Old High Middle School, one of my favorite mm -hmm. schools here. Just an incredible team, um, great maker space there. Um, I love the leadership there. But maybe I'm able to go out and leave school a little bit early because it's a day that a, a blockbuster movie has come out. So I'm mm -hmm. going to run down and go to Skylight oh, Cinema. Nice. Oh, I'm going to have a bucket of popcorn uh, and I'm going to watch a favorite blockbuster movie that I'm going to close out because it's first Friday, right? Right. So I'm going to end up around the square and have this great celebration of uh, uh, of the Bentonville community coming together. In fact, that was one of the first things that I noticed about this community and that, that I think is one of the other pieces that makes this place special. First Fridays. Oh my gosh. Oh gosh, yes. Okay, that's just that's just Thursday, Friday. Saturday, I'm getting up. It's Tinkerfest weekend, so I'm at the Amazium. I'm taking apart a car. I'm learning how I'm learning how to run across a pool of oobleck. I'm I'm meeting, you know, uh, scientists from all over the country. Oh, I'm tired. I got to go home take a nap. But because that night there's a there's a naturals game. Oh, or nice. I got to go catch a, a a hogs basketball game, right? Saturday night, so I'm going to go watch some sports. Sunday morning, going to head off to, 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 to church. After church, got to get to nature, right? We're in the natural state. So I'm, I'm at Kohler. Or I'm taking a, a, a hike up at Blowing Springs or going down to Devil's Den, and I'm going to get some nature in. Um, and then to close out my day, I'm going to go around the Bentonville Square, and I'm going to get a scoop of ice cream. I Right. I got to get that scoop of yes. ice cream, and I just got to breathe in the fact that this was the most epic, awesome weekend uh, ever had. And then I'm going to sleep like the Dickens because I'm going to be tired as all get out. Oh, man. And I was hoping ice cream on the square was in there. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I want to do that every night, but I, I felt like that would be a little bit, yeah. a little bit you know, over the top. Yeah. Well, as a kid, you, you could and it would be okay. As an adult, it does not work for me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I found that uh, I've tried that I and I, right. Well, for an adult, what's the best weekend look like for you? I heard some common ele some elements that could belong in an adult weekend too. <laughs> I mean, I, I will embarrassingly admit my adult weekend actually might look remarkably similar, yes. except maybe I'm going to head to a Crystal Bridges uh, show mm -hmm. or a, a music show on, on Saturday night. But each one of those things is just as much fun for me as an adult as it would be for me as a kid. So I think that's funny. It's actually almost ab about the same, although Saturday night might look a little different. Absolutely. Well, Sam, uh, after 10 years, you must have a few of these stories, quite a few. Tell me a hashtag because Bentonville story. That is a moment or a full-fledged mm -hmm. story that you look at it and go, you know, that could only happen in Bentonville or it describes the essence of this place. I, Gosh, there's, <laughs> there's so many moments, James. Um, early on when I, when I lived here, 
uh, when I lived here, I still live here. Uh, early yeah. on here, I was at first Friday. We were, we were, uh, we were powering the amazium tent and, uh, having fun. Uh, you know, thousands of people around the square. There's this energy. It's beautiful, but then it goes quiet. And okay, this is strange. Like why, why did the square just get quiet all of a sudden? And, and all of a sudden word comes back. Tom Cruise is in town. <laughs> so Tom Cruise was having dinner over at, uh, at, a uh, um, uh, Tavola mm-hmm. and the entire square emptied out to go stand in front of, of, uh, of, of Tavala. That's hilarious. And so, so it goes quiet. Now let me, let me counter that with, um, about a year. Let's see. I went out on the, on the floor and, and, um, I, I, I just, I, what I found out from our membership team is that, uh, there was a, a show filming down in Fayetteville for, for an extended period of time. And, you know, an Oscar award winning actor was part of that show and had been living in town for a long time. And what I find out is that, his family was here and they were coming to the amazium almost weekly, if not multiple times a week. Cause they had younger kids and they were exploring at the amazing. I had no idea. Wow. No one, they told me. Um, and, uh, what I love about that is I feel like there's that, that transition that it was just, it was like a, a matter of course. There are, there are folks here who are doing amazing things around the world. And, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, at the Amazium, it was just, it was a kid and parents exploring, having fun, being a little bit goofy. And so I'm kind of glad I didn't know until the end, because I would have been the strange person who went out and said like, oh, hi. Um, but our team was like, yeah, that's just, that's, that's just Wednesday. They're it's just here. Been happening every day around yeah. here. Yeah. Well, hey, a uh, super important question. If somebody wants to reach you, I've got a few more questions, but I mm-hmm. want to make sure I get this in. Or if they want to learn more about the Scott Family Amazium, how do they do it? Well, first of all, come to the Scott Family Amazium. If you want to learn more about it, come on out. Um, yeah. you, you don't just have to be a kid. You can be an adult. You don't have to have kids. In fact, we have adult nights as well that help allow uh, adults to come uh, without kids. Uh, we're at uh, 1009 Museum Way. Um, at the corner of J Street and Museum Way. Uh, go ahead and check out our website, uh, mazium.org, A-M-A-Z-E-U-M dot O-R-G. Um, or feel free to reach out to, to me, uh, S-Dean, S-D-E-A-N at amazium.org. Love to, love to hear your science stories. Cool. Very cool. So what's, what's the future of the Amazium uh, look like and, and it, even in its role in, in Bentonville and the growth and development of this place? Well, I think, I mean, we're excited. I mean, you'll be hearing a lot more of announcements in 2023 about what's what's coming up. You know, what was a museum that was going to be much smaller, has double our team size, has more than double the attendance we thought we would have. Mm-hmm. Um, and so our, our building isn't big enough to do all the things we want to do. So you'll hear some announcements. We're going to do some expansion work. Um, we're excited about both inside and outside. We want people to have better access to our tools and our maker space. So, you know, I think we want more opportunities in the region for people to be able to learn how to work with their hands and build and make, um, which we love hearing, you know, things like what's happening with the collaborative and, and of course, down at Fayetteville Library. You know, we think there's a whole network of maker rich spaces that are yes. happening and, and we're excited to be able to, to, to turn that on. Uh, as well. And things like mobile maker, you know, mobile amazium chance to, we're already out at a number of, you know, hundred times a year out at, at locations all around the region. We want to keep doubling down. You should have an amazium moment whenever and wherever you are, whether you're out around a square for a festival or whether you're at home, you know, playing with rice and beans and, and want to learn how to count and sort, you should be able to have these zing moments, however old you are and wherever you are. You should be able to. I, I was having uh, one of those moments one day close to 9 p.m. down by the splash pad where y'all had these big jack-in-the-box looking things. <laughs> and, and and you had to yell into the speaker to get the, the what do you call them, the, the wavy They're things. Inflatable. Yeah, the inflatables uh, to yeah. come out. Yeah. And I remember I was yelling into the speaker for him to come out. And I'm like, man, they're they're just not coming out. And I heard, James, it's closed. It's nine o'clock. And I turned around. And of course it was you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone had to close them up for the night. They had to go to sleep. And that was my night to close them up. That uh, was great. <laughs> well, hey, uh, a few random questions. As a child, what was your favorite family vacation? There, there are two things. One is we spent summer at my grandparents. Uh, uh, they, they lived in rural West, they lived in Morgantown, West Virginia, and they had a, a rural house that had about 80 acres of land. Mm-hmm. So just hiking the land and, and, um, and actually, you know, walking with my grandpa, 
you know, up, right. up, up the hill uh, was memorable. And then we, uh, we would try and do a, uh, we try and drive to get to water at some point in time. So we try and get to beach vacation, which, which I loved. Although I, I think I have a tendency to get sunburn and stung by things more so than most folks. So <laughs> despite that, I still like to go to water at least once a year. That's cool. Well, you can keep doing that. You can get to Florida, I believe on seven direct flights from here. So, uh, <laughs> that is we, true. we can get you to water. Uh, growing up, what were your favorite hobbies? You know, uh, I love being outside. I mean, I feel like this is the, this is the, uh, generational meme that like going out, hopping on the bike, riding mm -hmm. around with three or four or five friends and just, um, doing a little bit of, um, uh, not mischief, but, you know, going, going, one of our neighbors had, you know, great, uh, they had two plots of land and, and, um, so we would love to go back into their, their trees and their shrubberies and whatnot Sweet. and just have these adventures or, so I love that. I loved, uh, loved reading, um, since I was a, a young kid, was a comic book reader growing up. Okay. Still love to read comic books, uh, graphic novels, um, and uh, love sports, so love volleyball. Anything that didn't require like a racket or a bat. If I could touch it, hit it with my hand or my feet, I was great. The moment you introduce something in between the two, like it was not going to turn out well, James. I, I understand. <laughs> totally understand that. Uh, Sam, if you were a cartoon character, which one would you be and why? Boy, I feel like there, there are answers that I could give that are going to be cool and slick and suave. Uh, mine's going to be Scooby-Doo. Oh, man. <laughs> right? I mean, out of the whole mystery, <laughs> Mr. Ink gang, I think it would be Scooby because, you know, he just was was this happy-go-lucky, happy to go anywhere, maybe a little bit frightened about some things, but still uh -huh. willing to, to, to help set the trap for the ghost and um, certainly love to eat giant sandwiches. So oh, yeah. I think all that goes. Definitely. I, I have to ask real quick, pro-Scrappy-Doo or anti-Scrappy-Doo? Yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not anti Scrappy Doo, but I but I do think that that took away from the magic of of, of the rest of the game. <laughs> you bet. Okay, a uh, couple more questions, not so random. If you were limited forever to a single piece of advice for families with youngest children, what would that be? So uh, Albert Einstein had a quote that, which I, which I love, and it was, um, "I have no special talents except that I am passionately curious." So stay passionately curious, kiddo, but actually for the parents, stay Same. curious, encourage that curiosity, even if it means you've got to clean up a mess after. I love that. That's actually one of my favorite quotes. I, I love that. Um, okay. Last question. Uh, what's something I should have asked you that I did not ask? Can, can I, can I twist that? Yeah. James, tell me something that you were curious about that, that, that excites you about amazium, about the natural world. Tell me a moment that of, of curiosity for yourself. Uh, I, I'm always, I mean, I know there's physics and science behind it and how it works. Uh, I don't know if this is a curiosity as much as amazement that every time I get in an airplane, I think I ought to just be screaming, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm flying through the air in a metal, metal tube. Right. You know, that, that that even works. I don't really get that that still that that somehow works and i know that it does work and i understand the airflow and stuff around it but it still amazes me that that even works so i'm really glad you're you got that exhibit around airflow coming up well we'll help add a couple layers to to your understanding right and the world is spinning under your yeah. under you while and you're that's flying. happening right. right right and somehow we get back on the ground safely uh growing up there's two things well i wanted to be an astronaut uh, and of course, out of that meant I wanted to fly and, you know, the Air Force immediately shot me down because you, you know, in those days, you basically had to go through the military <laughs> to get to be an astronaut, yeah. days of the uh, space shuttle and so on. And the first thing I learned was there was zero chance because I didn't have 2020 uncorrected vision. <sighs> they, yeah, they shot it all down right from the start. So I get to watch everybody else do it. But now we're getting into an era where. Yeah, I don't have enough money to get to space, but I mean, William Shatner maybe. flew. Yeah, I'm just saying we're getting closer. Right. I was just down at uh, NASA Johnson uh, last week for a, a science center conference, and I sat next to someone and I said, "Well, before you worked at at, uh, uh, at the space center, Houston, what what did you do?" And she looks at me, she goes, "Like I was an astronaut." So instantly the conversation was changed. I had to I had to go, Ugh! and um and I'm like, what, 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 what missions did you fly? And she's like, well, I, I, I worked on the Hubble telescope. I was the last person to repair that wow. Hubble telescope before it was decommissioned. And then I spent 200 days in space. 
And I'm like, well, tell me about 200 days. What was it like? And she's like, when I came home, everything was just in a different place. And so, I mean, for me, it's like, oh, okay, curious. I don't know if I want to be an astronaut quite as much. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we are out of time, but we have a table full of toys. So will you tell me about one of these? Well, I, I think what I want to do is um, give you a gift because awesome. you need to have a whole package of curious, curiosity inducing things. Yes, I do. To take back, including your very own lapel pin. So every year we do a special pin I've wanted one um, of these. based on whatever year. And so this is our seventh year, uh, which is your copper anniversary. So yes. please, thanks for being a very special guest. Thanks for bringing Check Joseph and your family out to enjoy the Amazium. You're, 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 you're part of our extended family, James. Thanks well, thank you so much, um, Sam. Thanks for spending time with me and the Bentonville Beacon audience and for making this amazing uh place where i can bring my son and it really stokes his curiosity and he has a blast and i have a blast with him and for everything you're doing for uh, our community and, and really helping people learn and explore and stay curious thanks james well hey thanks to our bentonville beacon audience uh, without you this show could not be successful so please keep coming back visit bentonvillebeacon.com to see all of our episodes uh and of course hit subscribe if you're uh, listening on your favorite podcast player but keep coming back to learn more about bentonville and northwest arkansas this place where you get more of what you want and less of what you don't thanks see you next time